All right, good morning. Welcome back to the Tour de France. Welcome back to watching me paint these things and talk about the race. And when these are all done for today's stage, you can see all of the work. I usually do five, six paintings, maybe seven. I think I'm averaging 5.4 paintings per stage. But you'll be able to see those at my blog, theartofcycling.blogspot.com. And then uh, every one of those sites, every one of those posts on the blog site has a click through to where you can purchase the paintings if you feel so inclined. I hope you will. You know, I'm just doing these because I love doing them. But naturally, selling a couple of them would certainly be a nice thing. So that is a possibility for you. And they're only $75 a piece, plus shipping. And yes, I can ship them anywhere in the world and pretty much have. I think I have shipped, I know I have shipped to every continent, except Antarctica. Waiting for that one, that'll be funny. Of course, it's the dead of winter in Antarctica right now, so I doubt I will ever ship one to Antarctica. Not too many people down there this time of year. So what I'm working on right now is um, the breakaway. Usually my first painting of the day is a breakaway image, but this is one of the riders, 157, sorry. Oh, um, Rosetto, who's actually been off the break, pract off the front practically every single stage, it seems like. One of the Colt Fides riders. But as they start up the first small climb, and it's a pretty flat stage today. They're calling it the last of the spinner stage before we get to Paris. He's dropped back to his team car, appears to be having a problem with his um, handlebars of some sort, so the mechanic, and this is a pretty ridiculous thing. I mean, cool, but seemingly ridiculous. Although, it's not ridiculous in the sense that any work on the bike must be done while they're moving because time is such a precious commodity. And if you were to stop side of the road and try to get a bike sorted, it just, uh, you'd lose too much time. You'd never catch back on to the Peloton. So they'll do a lot of bike repair at speed, going down the side of the highway, roadway, whatever. And um, how the mechanics keep their fingers, this really scares the bejeebies out of me when they're trying to fix a derailleur with the wheels spinning, bicycle doing 20, 30K, 40K an hour, mechanic hanging out. Here he's not quite so, but you can see he's popped out of the car. I mean, he's well out. And I doubt there's anybody on the inside holding on to his waist, making sure he doesn't hit a bump and fall right out of the car. I have seen it happen in races where the uh, mechanic's holding on to the bike and then they hit a bump, the cyclists in the car. <laughs> Basically, it looks like the mechanic just yanks the cyclist down and it's a crash. Equally scary because, you know, it's conceivable they could then run over their own cyclist. I've never seen that happen, fortunately. So I'm just getting the composition figured out, laying these, uh, the drawing in with this um, India ink quality permanent pigment um, fine marker. It's actually made by Faber-Castell. I would love to be able to use the India ink, but then I would be in the position of waiting for the ink to dry. And by using these pins, that eliminates that delay. Because clearly, part of the equation here is speed. It is for the tour, it is for the racers, <laughs> it is for the mechanics. But it also is for me, trying to get these things done quickly so that you can enjoy them, so that they're as close to real time in the race as possible. And so that uh, I can do some other things with my life during the month of July, not much. call this a quick repair. What is today? 
18th. Sounds like it. All right, so that's the image. And now start laying the color in. But you can see I'm trying to get this nice diagonal line, trying to push it, and you can just feel the bend so your eye travels up through the riders and bends around the corner, just like the riders are about to do. So that was part of the composition thought process, is how do you get that something interesting, invigorating. Um, also, and I don't think I've ever commented on it, but you may have noticed, I don't do any preliminary sketching on these. So when you see me working with the dark line, that's, you know, that's what I'm doing. There's nothing, no way I'm trying to do a pencil sketch and then start laying the ink in and you're just not noticing it. I just don't do it. I've never been a big fan of erasers. <laughs> no particular reason other than cleaning up the schmutz from erasing. So, and that's one of the things with watercolors is that because it's a translucent medium, if you make a mistake, there's really no going back. There's no correcting it. Oil painting, the oil sticks I use that you can see on my website, gregleach.com. Um, you can paint over it. You can scratch it out. You can let it dry and paint over it. An opaque medium allows you the opportunity to correct mistakes. Watercolors, not so much. So if you make a mistake, which let's face it, we all do, you either need to start over. I'll never really find there. I just made a mistake, but I was caught it so that I can accentuate the color around what I wanted to leave blank. I'm actually realizing I wanted to leave that for the little yellow stripe. This is the number plate of the rider's bike. So laid the flesh tone in. Now I'll move to the um, darkest of the warm colors, which sounds a little silly, I know, but um, so red and green tend to be the same value, but obviously one is a cool color and one is a warm color. For those of you who don't know or haven't seen one of these already, warm colors can best be described as those associated with fire, cool colors as those associated with water or shadows, trees. Pick your metaphor for a cool place to be. Um, but the red and green are the same value, so they tend to be a little harder to tell apart. That's why it's the most common colorblind combination because you can't use value to help distinguish which color is which. All right, so now we're gonna move to the um, cool colors. Slight misnomer of cool when you're using this bright green, but still, it's green, so it's cool. All right, so that's all of that, that's a particular the uh, Monty Gobert used these uh, brilliant green helmets. In normal life, I'm not a big fan of bright colored clothes, but when you're out on the roads, so my cycling kit tends to be very brightly colored. I like to be seen. Sometimes it almost feels like the drivers are using that bright color as Oh, look, there's a cyclist. Let's go run them over. <laughs> but <laughs> it uh, it's really important to be seen. I've actually noticed a new trend in cycling, which I think is very wise, and two of my neighbors who bike commute during the day do this. They're taking pool noodles, those bright colored foam tubes, and uh, there's a state law that you must leave um, three feet when you overtake a cyclist. Pass, for those who don't use British <laughs> terminology. Um, but when you pass somebody, you must leave three feet. So cyclists have started taking these noodles 
and strapping them laterally across the back of their bicycles so that they stick out into the public, into the roadway, and making them three, making themselves three feet wider, which is a brilliant idea. I first noticed that on a um, Instagram post for a long distance cyclist. But that way you have that extra bright object that makes you more visible to the drivers and then the drivers see it and go oh that's something I don't want to run into so they move over a little more as they should have regardless and it just makes the cyclists have that safety space that they really should have because otherwise and I don't do that have not done that um, considering it now though but uh and so drivers will crowd me. I had a conversation. <laughs> it was actually fairly polite. And I think I actually made the guy understand that he did have to give me three feet when he overtook me. Fortunately, it just was a conversation. I was a little nervous it might become more. But so a lot of riders, I mean drivers, just don't understand my other little pet peeve with drivers because believe me we hear those cars with the exception of electric cars they're getting it's a little disconcerting for myself as a cyclist because you don't hear them coming but you can hear a car coming so you don't we hear you you don't need to toot your horn at us if you're tooting your horn I think something more dangerous might be about to happen so just so you know, you don't need to honk. <laughs> we know you're there. But if something crucial is happening, please honk. Let us know. Warn us. So just about closing in on the completing this piece here, just getting the rest of the bib numbers, the race numbers on the back here, the little want to lay in the greens of the uh, grass along the side of the road here. You can just see a bit of two fans standing along the side of the road. The other thing, I'm not even sure I've mentioned it yet, is a big part of watercolor is the white paper. And there is no white paint, because that's going to be opaque. So you're leaving anything you want white, like his jersey the front part of his this car you can only see the front part they're all white so that's just plain paper right now and I've done the shadows on the roadway and now I'm going to lay in the road which I'm using that same fabricated black and adding just a bit of blue to it and then this is because I want it light, it's got a lot of water in it. Right now it has too much. That's what that little tap on the paper towel was about. But see, now you can see that shirt. You can see that it's something different. And up under here, under the armpit. So now that white shirt pops out. Same thing back here with these guys in their shirts. And you can see this little puddle as long as I catch that puddle while it's still a puddle and hasn't started drying, I can drag that paint around. So a big part of watercolor is the fluidity working. I mean, let's face it, basically painting with dirty puddles. And then there we go. And I want to put a touch of grass right over here. Just a little anchor that corner. And then I'm going to get a little bit of very moist blue. There's a lot of water in this. Again, you can see that little puddle. But that's going to give me just a hint of a shadow, which gives it just a bit more three-dimensional quality. And there we go. That's that piece. And also, let me just 
quickly say that I'm using Richland Art watercolors. The particular watercolors are St. Petersburg. I'm also using their brushes, Steve Quiller brushes. I can't recommend them enough. They are fabulous. Clearly, they give you beautiful color, and the brushes give you beautiful control. Please subscribe, give it a like, let your friends know, and thanks for taking the time to look.